Each year, hundreds of thousands of people across America are fired or let go from their job and presented with a severance package. When an employee accepts one of these severance deals, they're given money in exchange for their signature at the bottom of that contract. But what the heck is in these? This video is going to explain what is in the typical severance contract because these are not free money. You give up significant legal rights. But because contracts are pretty boring, I'm gonna keep this video interesting by comparing this $10,000 severance agreement versus this $400 plus thousand dollar severance agreement. Before we get into it, we need to get three simple things out of the way. Number one, you're about to see actual severance agreements of former clients of mine. All identifying information has obviously been redacted, but these are as real as it gets. Number two, I've made several other videos on severance. One was about how to determine if your severance offer is fair or not. And the other was about how to negotiate for more severance if you didn't get offered something fair. I highly recommend that you watch those other videos after you finish this one. I'll give you the links at the end of this video. Number three, I have a license to practice law only in California, but I've made this video to help anyone in America because most of the terms in a severance deal are very similar from state to state. However, YouTube videos are not legal advice. If you need legal advice, call an employment lawyer in your state so he or she can read your actual agreement and hear your termination story. This video is meant to give you a basic understanding of what is in these agreements so you can ask your lawyer educated questions. Now, if you did work in California and you were presented with a severance deal and you think that there was something seriously wrong with your termination or suspect with your termination, don't be afraid to call my office for a free consultation if you think I've earned your phone call. All right, let's get this party started. Okay, for this video, we're largely gonna be looking at the computer screen at certain contracts. And that sounds really boring, but we're gonna compare this $10,000 severance agreement with this $400,000 plus dollar severance agreement. So you can see the differences between the two. Um, you'll find that they're not that different. Um, but I really want you to understand the basics. What are they saying? What do these terms actually mean so that you can make an informed decision whether or not you want to sign it or if you need to hire an attorney to do a better review. So here we're going to be looking, uh, we're going to be going back between this is the $10,000 one, simple redacted, and then we're going to look at the complex redacted, which is the $400,000 plus dollar one. Number one, party definitions they usually define who are the parties to the agreement. So if we look here, it says, this agreement is made by and among the name of the employee, the employee, and the name of the company, the company. Um, this is really where it lays out who is who and how they're going to be referred to in the contract. Simple enough, right? It does this exact same thing in the $400,000 one right here. Number two, recitals. The next part of the contract is kind of introductory remarks, and we call these recitals. Um, you'll see in the simple uh, $10,000 one, the recitals are very short. In the complex one, the 400K one, they're much longer, but they largely are just introducing what the contract is, what it's for, and what the parties are trying to do with it. So. Uh, I think the better example here is in the $400,000 one. Um, we'll skip some of the unimportant ones, but here's really what you should read. Whereas the parties intend that executives employment with the company will terminate on, and they give a specific date here. For this bigger contract, the 400K one, this person was an executive and they were telling him or her that they were firing this person uh, in the future. And it was like seven months in the future. And then the person was going to was going to work during that t seven months, six or seven months, and then they were going to get paid a lump sum at the end of that time period um, to as recompense for signing this agreement. And we'll get into the specifics of that in a minute. 
the simple, the $10,000 severance agreement, it just simply says, this agreement sets forth the resignation of the employee, that this is an amicable settlement and the payment of severance. Whereas in order to accomplish the foregoing, the parties are willing to enter into this agreement. So it's kind of telling the purpose of it. And frankly, this, these recitals and the simple agreement were really poorly written, um, but my client didn't want to try to negotiate the unimportant part of the agreement, so they simply signed it. Um, so yeah, that's the recitals, not very exciting. Number three, severance payment and the time frame of the payment. The next part of the agreement is the meat and potatoes. Well, I guess you should say it's the meat and the next provision is the potatoes. This is where they're gonna tell you what they're paying you and the time frame in which they are going to pay you that amount. So if we look at the $10,000 severance deal, uh, it literally says, in consideration of employee's promises, that means in exchange for the employee signing this agreement, the company hereby agrees to pay employee the total sum of $10,000. That's the severance payment. Okay, that's how much they're gonna pay you. The next part of it is where they talk about kind of the taxation. What is the, uh, how is this gonna be taxed? Most, in, most severance deals, they say something to the effect of, and withholdings will be held uh, as normal. So let's say they're paying you $10,000 and you actually made $10,000 a month working for the company. Well, the company, when they pay you normally, they withhold money for social security, disability, unemployment, that kind of stuff. They will usually say that they're gonna do that with the severance payment. Now, this one was a little bit different. They were gonna pay this person on, uh, uh, on a 1099. So he says right here, 1099 basis. And so in order to do that, they required the person to sign a IRS form W-9. That's not all that unusual, it happens all the time, but this part also usually identifies and tells the employee, hey, you gotta pay taxes on this. And if the IRS comes after us, the company, you're gonna have to indemnify us if you didn't pay your taxes or if somehow we're getting audited for this. That's not unusual at all, and usually I don't have my clients try to negotiate that part simply because Everybody knows they gotta pay taxes, and the company's just simply saying, if you don't pay your taxes and we get audited for it, you're gonna have to pay us back for that. And that's totally fair. Then, usually this agreement says when the person is going to get paid, the time frame in which they're going to get paid. So in this one, um, it says the company will pay the employee within two business days of both parties executing this agreement. That's really fast compared to most. In the complex severance agreement, the $400,000 one, they kind of outline uh, that the person's gonna have to work for six or seven more months and then they're getting fired. So they have this transition period and they say, during this transition period, you're gonna receive your current salary during this transition period. And that essentially meant that since this person was making, I think 250 grand a year, they were gonna receive their base salary as normal during that transition six or seven month period. Then they're gonna get fired and they're gonna get paid severance. And in this case, this person will receive one year salary or $250,000 uh, less applicable withholdings, as we talked about earlier, to be paid within 15 days of the effective date of this agreement. What that means is this person's gonna get a lump sum once they get officially fired of 250 grand minus tax withholdings. Cool, that's nice, lump sum. They got fired, that sucks, but now they're gonna get an entire year's salary worth because this person negotiated out a significant severance deal. And that's not where it ended for the executive. This person's also going to get, if the board of directors declares one, the annual bonus. So if they declare an annual bonus for the company, that executive would get it. And likely in this person's case, I think it was gonna be like 50 to 100 grand, maybe even six figures. So this person was gonna get six or seven months of base salary. They were gonna get a 250 grand lump sum once they were officially fired. Then if the board of directors declared a bonus, they would also get a bonus, which would potentially be six figures. And then it goes on to say COBRA premiums. This person might actually get 12 months of their health insurance premiums paid by the company. So normally when somebody gets fired and they're on the company's health insurance plan, 
the company needs to provide them with a COBRA notification, which says they can elect to continue using company health insurance benefits, but they simply need to pay the premium. This is very common, very normal, and a lot of people, when they're negotiating their severance deal, they negotiate that the company is going to pay their COBRA premiums, their health insurance premiums, for a certain amount of time. Now, again, this is a highly compensated executive. This is somebody who had a lot of leverage over the company. Now, what this doesn't tell you is why is one person getting paid 10 grand and the other person getting paid $400,000? That is far beyond the scope of this video. In fact, I made another video talking about is your severance agreement fair or not, or how to evaluate the fairness of a severance agreement or not. And I highly recommend you watch that video once you finish this one, if you haven't already. Number four, the release. Uh, like I said, the, the severance provision was the meat of the agreement. The next provision, the release, is the potato. All right, this is what you're giving up for the money. This is the whole point of why the company is offering you severance. They are offering you money in exchange for a release. So let's scroll down here and let's look. The release. Essentially, what all this says is that you are giving up your right to sue the company. And in the $400,000 severance agreement, it says it generally. It says they're giving up your right. Executive releases and forever discharges company from any and all claims, complaints, charges, duties, obligations, demands, and causes of action of any kind, of any uh, nature and character, known and unknown, which employee may now have or has ever had against any of the you know, releasees, like co the company entities, the employees, subsidiaries, parent companies, which arose prior to or on the date of the execution of this agreement. So you're signing an, ag an agreement, giving up your right to sue the company for anything that happened in the past. From the date you know you signed the agreement on January 1st anything that happened before that is covered by this agreement anything in the future is not now in both of these agreements there's this general release and then they get into some specifics uh, for example the age discrimination and employment act Americans with Disabilities Act in the four hundred thousand dollar severance agreement it specifically outlines, you're giving up your right to discrimination, harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination claims. And then they outline specific statutes, the California Labor Code, Labor uh, Private Attorney the PAGA claims, the Fair Employment and Housing Act. These are California specific statutes because this was a California company and a California employee. Um, most severance deals have this big release provision and it's really just trying to hammer home what you're giving up by signing the agreement. Number five, no admission of liability. It usually says something to the effect of, the parties agree that nothing contained in this agreement and no action taken by either party uh, with regard to this agreement shall be construed as an admission of liability or that either party did anything wrong. So by signing this agreement, you're acknowledging the company is not admitting to doing anything wrong and you're not admitting that you did anything wrong. Both parties are signing this to gain peace and move on, okay? Number six, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Now, if you're over the age of 40 and the company has fired you and they're offering you a severance deal, there's usually, because by law they have to have it in here, a provision called the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, or ADEA. What this law says is that if a company provides an employee a severance deal, they have to give them 21 days in which to consider the severance offer. And if the employee signs it, they have to give the employee seven days in which they can change their mind and revoke their signature on the severance deal. They have to tell you that you should consult with an attorney before you sign the deal or that you had an opportunity to consult with an attorney before you sign the severance deal. Long story short, this is a mandatory law, so it's not, and there's nothing unusual about it, uh, and it's in almost every severance deal where the person is over the age of 40. Number seven, confidentiality. Now, and you all knew this was coming, the next really big provision is confidentiality. Obviously, right? By signing this agreement, you're gonna have a muzzle on your mouth as to what you can talk about after you sign it. 
um, and this is in every severance deal. So here in the simple $10,000 one, there's a confidential information. The employee shall not use nor disclose to anybody any of the company or its affiliates or predecessors or financial information that the employee learned while working with the company. Confidential information shall include confidential, proprietary, trade secret, scientific, technical, business, blah, 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 blah. You're giving up your right to talk about proprietary things that you learned while working at the company. Also, and this is really important, um, if we go down to the confidentiality provision um, on the $400,000 one, there's going to be part of this that says you can't tell people about how much money the company is paying you in the severance deal. So let's say they're paying you 50 grand and you sign it and you get that money. You can't go tell all your buddies who still work at the company, hey, they paid me $50,000. That would definitely breach almost every single severance agreement I've ever read. They don't want people knowing how much they paid you. And frankly, it's not anybody's business and you shouldn't want people knowing either. They also have provisions regarding trade secrets, proprietary information, and this is really important that you carefully evaluate this and carefully read it. Most companies have things that they want to keep quiet because they derive economic value from keeping those things quiet, whether it be the design or a formula for a product or how they manufacture something or a customer list, whatever. They don't want you going out and using that with a competitor or, or telling people about it. So make sure you understand what you're signing before you sign it. Number eight, a non-compete and or non-solicitation clause. After confidentiality, there's usually a paragraph or two about non-competition or non-solicitation. What do these mean? Well, um, in many states, uh, employers and employees are allowed to contract and actually sign an agreement that if the employee is fired or they leave their job at that company, they can't go work for a competitor. Now with some exceptions, provisions, non-competition provisions like that are unenforceable in the state of California. So if you're in California, largely they can't do that, even though I see companies try to do it all the time. In many states, non-competition agreements are legal. So you're going to have to check with your state's laws or consult with an attorney in your state to find out if those provisions are valid in your state. Beyond that, we also have non-solicitation provisions that says if you go work for a different company or a different industry or even a competitor, you can't go back to your buddies who worked at the you know, employer and solicit them to leave and come work for your new company. There's usually a provision, a uh, time limitation on that. It says you can't do it for a year or two. Um, depends on your agreement, your state's law, but largely those are enforceable. Number nine, non-cooperation. After these non-competition, non-solicitation provisions, we usually have something called non-cooperation. What this is asking you to do is if a buddy of yours or somebody at the company who's still there is thinking about suing the company and they're trying to find out information about the company or they're trying to get you to help them with a lawsuit, this provision is prohibiting you from cooperating with them in their quest to sue the company and get money from them. Or if there's some sort of government inquiry going on uh, into that company's affairs, you can't cooperate with them. Now there's limitations to this and you're going to want to read your provision specifically and consult with an attorney in your state as to what's allowed in your state. But generally it's saying, hey, if somebody is currently still working there or used to work there and is trying to sue them, you can't cooperate with them. You need to avoid them. There's usually also a provision in there that talks about what if you get subpoenaed? Like somebody else is suing the company and their lawyer sends you a subpoena for a deposition or for documents. You usually, in these provisions, need to inform the employer that you've been subpoenaed to give them a chance to contest that subpoena or to limit it or something to that effect before you know, they get you into a deposition and you get to talk, talk and, and talk about whatever you want. 
So it's very important that you read this provision carefully if somebody's reaching out to you <laughs> and asking you for help or if you get a subpoena. Number 10, a non-disparagement clause. The next provision usually is, and you all knew this was coming, a non-disparagement provision, which usually says something to the effect of, you can't go into the media, or you can't go on social media, or you can't go out and write any, a mass email and blast the company after you've signed a severance agreement. You can't make up lies, you can't embellish things, you should keep your mouth shut after you sign a severance deal. That's what the provision says. Number 11, return of company property. This next part is very self-explanatory. It revolves around company property. Essentially, it usually says two things. Number one, if you haven't already, you need to return company property. This includes things like laptops, phones, company car, whatever, proprietary information. You need to affirm that you don't have it anymore and that you've sent it back or you need to affirm that you already have returned all company property. Um, so this is pretty self-explanatory. You just need to say that you've returned it all or that you're going to return it within a certain period of time, whatever your particular provision says. Number 12, activities that are not prohibited. Now after that, we usually have a provision called protected activity that is not prohibited. Uh, we have a big paragraph here in the $400,000 severance deal um, that says things that this agreement does not prohibit you from doing. And the best example of this is workers' compensation. Let's say you uh, sustain an injury while working for the company, um, and they lay you off, you sign a severance deal, and then your injury becomes uh, substantially worse after you sign the severance deal. Well, depending on your state's laws, and depending on what's written in this agreement, Usually this provision says that you can still file a claim like that. Or if you had a claim before you signed the severance deal, you can still pursue a claim like that. Now, there's a lot of other things that they can't prohibit you from doing, and they specifically have to tell you what those are in the severance deal. Not all employers follow that rule, by the way, but many do. Um, all this provision says, it details the things that you're allowed to do even after you sign the severance deal. 13, lawyer mumbo jumbo. What do I mean by that? Well, there's usually a lot of provisions. I think this $400,000 one has really good examples of what's typical. There's a lot of quick provisions like severability, uh, entire agreement, no oral modification, governing law, uh, counterparts, voluntary execution. What do, what do all these mean? A lot of people, they scratch their head when they're, re they're reading all this legalese. Well, I'll go through the, the, the common ones really quickly. Number one, severability. All this is saying is that if a judge is looking at an agreement and he or she or the court finds that one particular provision violates the law, this provision is instructing that judge to simply excise out that one small provision and enforce the rest of the agreement. That the judge, the court, shouldn't throw out the entire agreement because one small provision was violative of law. Okay? The next common one is the entire agreement. This one really confuses a lot of people, but really all it's trying to say is that if you sign this, you're agreeing that what is written on the four corners of the agreement, what is written on the paper, is what your agreement is. That if the company has promised you something orally, or there's another document floating around promising you something, no, what's written on this agreement is all that matters, and this supersedes all other prior agreements, whether oral or in writing. So what's written on the agreement is what, what matters, things outside that don't matter. The next common one, is, which is in almost every single severance deal, is the governing law. This is simply telling the judge which state's law to apply to the agreement and uh, where somebody would have to file a lawsuit if there's going to be a lawsuit over this agreement or the terms of the agreement. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people who work in California or they work in New Mexico, yet the employer is based in Washington or in you know, uh, Maine or Nebraska or something like that. Long story short, this is simply telling the court which law to interpret. Now, there's a lot of confusing, conflicting laws about what courts should do when presented with uh, provisions like that way beyond the scope of this video. 
uh, won't get into it, but largely this is simply telling the court which law to apply and where it's supposed to be litigated. Next, release effective date. This is trying to identify what date this agreement takes effect. Sometimes people sign an agreement, but it doesn't become effective till seven days after that. Sometimes the parties agree that the agreement doesn't become effective until you know six months down the road once they finish out the uh, transition period, which was the, the case in this agreement, things like that. Next are counterparts. This is very common, but essentially all it's saying is that uh, the company can sign this agreement and you could print out the same exact agreement, but it doesn't have the signature of the company representative on it and you could sign it and so long as you had both signed copies that would be treated as one agreement. So the parties can sign the same agreement and counterparts and would be effective. Not everybody's signature has to be on the exact same piece of paper. Next, this is very common. This is a voluntary execution. All this is saying is that you voluntarily agree to uh, sign this agreement. Not that complicated, not that exciting. And 14, the signatures. After that, it's pretty simple. We usually have a signature page where you put your scribble and date that you scribbled it and the company puts their scribble and the date that they scribbled it. Same thing on the $10,000 severance agreement the parties would sign right here. Please read carefully. This agreement includes a release of known and unknown claims. And then you sign it. And that's it. Severance agreements are scary they're complicated to, for people who aren't lawyers. A lot of people read it and they go, I don't understand what this is saying. But by and large, what these agreements are saying is you're giving up your right to sue the company in exchange for money. And these are all the stipulations and provisions surrounding that. Now, if you read through your severance deal, and there's a lot of things in there that are highly alarming to you, well, I strongly recommend that you call a lawyer in your state to get a consultation and pay them some money to explain those terms to you. Also, uh, if you are being fired under very suspicious circumstances, you think the law was violated in the way you were fired, then you should definitely call a lawyer in your state. If you are in the state of California and you worked in the state of California, you're more than welcome to contact my office for a consultation and review. Uh, the consultations are always free, but we do charge for severance review when it gets elevated to that level. But that, you know, sometimes a lot of people consult with us and they don't need a severance review and we tell them that. Finally, if you found this video to be helpful, uh, please consider giving it a thumbs up on the YouTube, you know, buttons down below. That really helps and tells you, YouTube that this video was helpful to you. Uh, if you know somebody who got fired recently and they were presented with a severance deal, send this video to them so that they can just at least start to formulate educated questions uh, to ask a lawyer in their state or a lawyer that they hire. I hope this video has been helpful to you and I hope you have a fantastic day. Take care.